are both based at the 3D Viz Lab, um, which is at the Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design in Dundee. Um, it's quite a small little lab, there's only a few of us, but um, we cover quite a lot of bases. So we do things from um, subsea survey of um, historic wrecks to uh, archaeological excavations and reconstructions to uh, aerial photography. So we really have all bases covered. Um, we're practice-based researchers working with digital media. So first and foremost, yep. uh, when posed with a problem, we like to make things. Um, our approach combines 3D survey data with animation and visual effects, um, most commonly used in film and TV, which means that we're able to communicate com uh, complex interpretations and data, while at the same time crafting an evocative sense of place. So, those are some of our greatest hits that you might recognise us from. <laughs> um, so we've got uh, Scarabray, The Cachethans, and uh, Yarosov, um, if you've maybe seen some of those animations before. So today, we thought we would talk about a couple of projects which are very close to home for us in Dundee. Over the past probably about two years, we ended up working on a series of different local projects which are inherently connected to a um, very powerful sense of local identity through the history and local mythologies that connect people to this city. So we've got um, the Dundee Law Iron Age Hill Fort animation, which we did for the McManus Galleries exhibition. Um, we'll also talk about the Dundee to Newtown Railway Line animation, um, and also the Dundee Royal Arches Augmented Reality project that we worked on. Um, these projects allowed us to revisit these sites and stories using the technology to help people kind of reimagine these places afresh. So hand over to Kieran. Awesome. So um, the Dundee Law is this um, hill which is a a sort of dominant feature of the city skyline, which is rumoured to be an extinct volcano. So that's the kind of main thing that, that people know about Dundee Law. It's a bit of a shame because it's not true. So <laughs> it's the eroded remnants of a volcanic sill, but it was never an active volcano. But it was, however, the site of an Iron Age hill fort. The only parts of the structure survived um, the building of the War Memorial and Car Park that you can see on the summit. So we were asked by the McManus Gallery, which is a local museum, um, to produce a visualisation film that told the story of the hill fort uh, for a temporary, a temporary exhibition of reflections on Celts. <laughs> so the Dundee Law is a familiar landmark that can be seen from around the city. Um, it was also a popular viewpoint, so people you can kind of drive up here and people come out to, um, you know, I guess, have a picnic and look at the the, the kind of vista with a panorama that stretches from the Scottish Highlands all the way around to Fife and the mouth of the River Tay. So the first step in our reconstruction of the Iron Age law was to take this well-known vista and transform it to how it may have looked 2,000 years ago. Um, so this rather therapeutic process of rewilding re the heavily urbanised Tay estuary uh, formed the background to Alice's speculative reconstructions of the hill fort itself. We thought it was important to contextualise the Iron Age site within a view of the landscape that may be familiar and recognisable, even though it is obviously radically altered um, from the appearance of the current day. So this is really about when we were kind of rolling back um, the landscape rather than uh, treating it as a 3D model, like thinking about just working from the, um, the kind of view out of the landscape that people are more familiar with and kind of connected to. Um, so these images show uh, the final composites of the film. Um, which I think we'll, if we have time, we'll show the, the kind of animated version at the end. And they combine structural and landscape reconstructions in 2D and 3D, uh, with details added to suggest the types of activities that we have evidence for within the hill fort. So we then lit the models and animated the sky um, using time-lapse footage, which is actually filmed on site, um, to give a sense of mood and atmosphere in the film. So the Dundee Law was a vitrified hill fort, so we also used visual effects compositing to animate how it might have looked during the fire that destroyed the walls. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so Alice also made digital scans of some of the artefacts associated with the site, which are now part of the museum collection, and we used the resulting models 
to show these objects outside of the display case. So we're trying to think of ways that we could use those models um, to show them in a bit more context than they would usually be if they were behind glass. So in this case, we give an impression of how the stone lamp might have looked when it was lit, just using sort of artificial lighting in the final render. So in this way, we use the physical evidence, both in the landscape and in the museum, to visually tell the stories of the archaeological interpretation. And this is done by layering elements, including the 2D and 3D reconstructions, the digital scans, artificial lighting and effects, to help drive the narrative while remaining connected to familiar landmarks and objects. Back to me. Back to me. Um, so following on from our work reconstructing the Iron Age on Dundee Law, we were asked to produce an additional series of short films and animations depicting key periods of history, um, in key, uh, key periods in the history of the law. So during our research for this project, um, our attention was drawn to a series of historic images depicting various locations and lost architecture along the old Dundee to Newtown railway line. Um, the railway line itself ties in very closely with the law because um, there actually used to be a tunnel that would run right through the hill itself. The law tunnel has long since closed, but locally it remains the subject of much intrigue and myth. So you can see some of the pictures here. Oh, no, back, back. We're not. <laughs> Wait. That's just going forward. It's just going forward. There we go. Oh, where oh, we had it. Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> okay, so in the images here, um, we've got, starting from the left, we've got Ward Road Station. Um, and if you kind of look up to the centre of the image, you can actually see Law Hill um, in the background there. Um, we've got the uh, Lockheed Station um, in the centre, and then the uh, Barrack Road Bridge, which is, um, I mean, I drive that road kind of every day to work. So it's places that are very familiar still to... Um, to people in Dundee. And that in the top corner is one of the very few photos of the law tunnel that existed. And the little photo next to it are, uh, I think, two wee boys um, in the 1970s when the tunnel was kind of still open and you could kind of still break in and explore. But it has since been, um, been closed up completely, um, presumably for kind of health and safety reasons. Um, these images are very well known locally. And they're often reproduced in newspaper articles and the like, referencing Dundee's industrial heritage. Um, we were really taken with the photographs when we found them, as they capture a really fantastic sense of place um, and have a powerful familiarity for the city. So after a few discussions, um, an idea to pop them out in 3D and kind of bring them to life started to develop. Could you click it manually, please? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so the railway line opened in December 1831 and it ran right up until the 1960s. So it witnessed the change from horses to steam to diesel. Um, during, the pro uh, during the project, we identified two key locomotives which used to run the line um, at various points in its history. Um, so we've got the Earl of Early, which is the reconstruction that you can see playing here. Um, that was kind of very much a workhorse locomotive. So did a lot of things like pulling uh, coal carriages and things like that. Um, and then we also have the, uh, the Oban Bogey, um, which is the photograph from Lockheed Station in the, the bottom right-hand corner. Um, and that was more of a passenger train, so um, that used to pull carriages and things. Um, Modelling the locomotives was uh, quite... Uh, oh, no, you are still so fine. Sorry. <laughs> I keep seeing your hand go for it. <laughs> So uh, modelling the locomotives was quite a challenging process. Um, compared to the Earl of Early, which comparatively looks very complicated, but actually there's a lot of engineers' drawings and loads of sketches and books um, from all different angles. So from a reconstruction and modelling um, process, it was actually fairly straightforward. Um, the open bogey, on the other hand, there's only a couple of photographs that we were able to find um, of that locomotive in particular. And, I started off thinking I was very clever and uh, trying to model it in uh, Maya using camera projections and uh, modeling up from the photograph, but we came across issues like um, this image here is actually a photocopy from um, a newspaper, so the image has been cropped and then it's kind of got various issues with focal length and things like that, so we ended up with sausage trains and all sorts, but luckily we had um, 
a lot of uh, help from a couple of local train buffs who really know their stuff. So we were kind of had a lot of back and forward with uh, these people and managed to get the uh, the trains right in the end. Because I don't know if you've ever worked with people who are really into trains, but really need to get the details right. So we're really happy that we managed to um, in the end. Um, so the next challenge. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the next challenge was popping out the images. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is achieved by modelling sections of the architecture in the foreground and projecting the image across different planes um, just to achieve a little bit of parallax when the camera moves, as well as giving depth to the scene um, for the train to move through. So in the same way that you saw in the... Uh, the project with the hill fort, um, where we took artifacts from the Manus collection, like the lamp, and added layers using visual effects methods to imagine them in a new light. For me, I think what was really interesting about this project was the way that the archival photographs were not just used as reference material, but were themselves brought to life with the addition of reconstructed elements and, uh, and visual effects. So I think, next slide if this isn't working. Thank you. So the last project that uh, we wanted to show you before we um, kind of play a couple of the animations at the end is the Neon Festival Arches project. Um, I'll introduce you to the Arches and then hand <coughs> over to Kieran who's going to tell you about the project in a bit more detail. Um, so starting again from the left, we have the 1844 Wooden Triumphal Arch, which was designed by harbour engineer James Leslie. So the story goes with this one, that on the 3rd of September, the city announced that Queen Victoria and Albert were planning a visit. They had a town meeting on the 5th of September, and then this arch was built in time for their visit on the 11th of September. Um, apparently, I think the, as, as far as we could find out from our research, it was built by um, people who kind of made cabinets and wardrobes. So needless to say, it kind of stood for about a week and then was taken down. Um, but the city really loved it, so the Stone Royal Arch, which you see in the centre, was designed by John Thomas Rocky from Glasgow, and that was completed in 1850. The arch then stood for 114 years before it was demolished to make way for the Tay Road Bridge access in 1964. Um, and then over on the right hand side we have the very recent 2016 cardboard arch, which was designed by Oliver Grostet and built by the people of Dundee. So I'll hand it back over to here. Do you want me to just do this? Yeah. I think that's misbehaving. Yeah. Okay, so the cardboard arch became part of the architecture of Dundee for just a few brief hours. It was built by a team of organisers and volunteers during the course of one Saturday in May 2016. So the top was built first and then lifted up by hand, and then new sections were added underneath. So slowly um, and entirely by hand, the finished ins installation emerged over the course of the day. Um, as the sun came up on Sunday morning, the arch briefly formed part of the Dundee skyline. For a temporary installation, it was an impressive feat of architecture and engineering built by the hands of the local community. Okay, next slide. Oh, yes. So Alice and I came to the site on the Sunday morning to collect a digital survey of the installation before it was toppled. We used both photogrammetry and laser scanning to gather as much data as we could in a brief time, but we were also struck by characteristics of the arch that eluded the survey, including the sense of occasion and presence of the temporary structure. So individuals made the cardboard arch their own by building it and by exploring it, but some also left their mark by signing the structure and leaving messages and drawings. You can't quite read that. My favorite bit of graffiti just says, sky's the limit. Um, the project reimagined the lost architecture of the Royal Arch in three dimensions, but was also deeply personal and relatable. And this is the experience that was behind the, the inspiration behind the visualization project that we undertook on the occasion of Dundee's Neon Digital Arts Festival. Oh, it's me. <laughs> um, so I was tasked with reconstructing the wooden arch. <laughs> Um, whose memory only survives through a handful of written descriptions, a couple of etchings, and also, very handily, a scale model, which we were lucky to find in the McManus Museum collection. Um, I should have said, actually, on the Locomotives project previously, that Earl of Airlie, as well as having 
lots and lots of engineers drawings. The McManus also have a scale model of that, so very handy. So they also had a scale model of the wooden arch. Um, however, if you look closely, you'll see that there are a couple of discrepancies between each representation of the arch, um, mainly in details like the, uh, the coat of arms on the top and also some of the curved detail on the uh, pillars kind of to, to the sides. Um, so we decided that uh, since we had a model, um, it's the best way to uh, start was maybe to do a little bit of photogrammetry. Um, of course, photogrammetry tends to be more forgiving for more organic shapes, so it didn't fare too well on the kind of uh, straight lines and right angles um, that form the model of the arch. But I was able to get just enough of a solid, uh, solid mesh to base my model on. Um, I was then able to switch out the messy photogrammetry mesh for my very nice clean one and reproject the textures and then clean them up. And then on to the Royal Arch. <laughs> um, so the Royal Arch, designed by uh, John Thomas Rohit and was built of sandstone in about 1850. Um, and it replaced the early wooden arch. So it stood for over 100 years and was well photographed during that time. So the aim of the digital reconstruction for this phase um, was to collate as many of the surviving photographs as possible and to explore whether photogrammetry could be used to derive the 3D structure from this archive materials. This is a little bit of an experiment looking at this um, like range of very different photographs over a long period um, and see if we could run photogrammetry through that kind of sparse set. So four of the local archives kindly supplied high resolution images. Um, so this is the Dundee Central Library, the University of Dundee Archives, um, City Council and DC Thompson. Um, the local publisher also have very extensive archives, including lots of uh, photographs of the arch. So we ended up, we kind of whittled this down to a set of 30 images, um, and the kind of the main criteria was that they were taken from a variety of angles um, around the arch. So we're looking essentially to form a decent image network, but obviously with, with images that weren't really shot for purpose. Um, and these images spanned uh, the, the lifespan of the arch. So we had ones from just after it was put up to um, close to when it was, it was torn down again. Uh, could I have the next slide? Yes. So resolving these photographs into a three-dimensional structure, we used a sort of photo scan, as you can see. Um, and we had two main issues. Firstly, of course, uh, these images have no useful metadata, so we had no focal length information of the lenses used in most cases. Um, and we didn't think it was worth trying to estimate that or trying to work out how it was, so we're leaving that parameter open, which means the software has one more parameter that has to find the kind of best guess for during this bundler adjustment. Um, and to kind of exasperate that, uh, of course, the arch and the surroundings have changed significantly over time. So the arch itself started off in sandstone and as it's inevitable it's sort of blackened towards the end of its life um, and the uh, surviving the kind of structures around so it's got the docks on one side in the city and the other and there's very few uh, of those buildings have remained upstanding for the, for the duration of the um, the arch so there's very few kind of points with a couple of exceptions of a church and maybe a couple of the buildings that have um, that we can kind of latch on to so to, to get around that, obviously the SIFT algorithm isn't going to pick up common points across these um, photographs. So to get around that, we're uh, placing uh, common uh, landmarks on the uh, features manually, and basically kind of starting to put in these points of this corner here is the same as that corner there, and trying to kind of get this orientation of the arch, and doing that over and over in the hope that it will magically kind of piece together the alignment it did at some point. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, um, as the alignment kind of comes together, we get the, the kind of sparse structure of the arch itself. Obviously, that's never going to be very good, so we weren't so interested in that. What we were interested in was the position of the cameras that kind of come out. So, what's nice is it was kind of reassuring to when this, you know, the, the alignment clicks into place was to see the kind of coherence of those camera positions and that they all represented viable viewpoints that you could photograph the arch from. So on the far side is the docks, and you can see there's only the kind of gaps in between those groups are where there's bodies of water, um, so there's not going to be any photographs there. 
um, and then you know we can kind of see almost see those three uh, sort of bits of the docks sort of uh, outlined. And then there's a lot more images on the on the landward side. There was two camera positions that first of all looked like an error. They were much higher than the rest. Um, and we figured these are actually from a vantage point on the balcony, the Caird Hall building. It's a big tall building just behind the arch. So that was all very reassuring. Um, and we start to you know get a sense that we have a um, a kind of you know correct alignment of, of the positions of the cameras. So this is a kind of semi-automatic process. Obviously, we're inputting the points manually because um, you know it's unable to kind of detect them with the range of photographs. But the alignment itself, the bundle adjustment, we just left up to Photoscan to, to deal with. Um, so uh, in other projects, we've been using this type of approach of encouraging. You know, an alignment of historical photographs obviously weren't shot for purpose in order to find the geospatial locations of, of historical photographs. So we can find an estimation of the focal length and sort of GPS position of, of photographs in the past, which is quite cool. In this project, we're not so interested in geospatial locations, but we use these camera positions to inform a process of image-based modeling. Next slide, please. So rather than using or attempting to use structure for motion to reconstruct the surface, that would obviously be massively pro problematic because of the differences in the images, um, we used image-based modeling, which is where features are manually reconstructed from two or more camera angles to triangulate each feature into its correct position in 3D space. This is a manual uh, modeling process that you would more normally do on top of a combination of orthophotos. But because we have the correct camera positions, we're able to do this tracing the perspective cameras. Um, so the resulting model is coherent in 3D because the positions of the cameras relative to each other is now known after that alignment process. Um, and this is the, uh, an image as a result of move the model. Obviously, during the process, the model is overlaid with the photograph, and that's how it's done. It's sort of traced on top. And I've just moved it to one side there just so that you can kind of see the comparison and it gets a bit confused. Um, so that's how we made this, this model. Next slide, please. So with that done, and the architecture of the arch uh, reconstructed, um, we also wanted to add details to suggest some of the human stories associated um, with the arch. So we spoke to local historians as well as, well as heraldry and vexillology experts to identify the flags used to decorate the arch in this photograph on the left. This is a little bit tricky because the photograph itself is undated. It's obviously motion blurred with a long exposure time, so the flags are kind of blurred towards the ends, and, and obviously monochrome, so quite difficult to identify the, the, uh, each of the flags. But we managed, to, including the presence of the Danish royal standard, um, which is on the, on the top left-hand side there, which is likely to have marked a visit by Queen Alexandra of Denmark in 1907. So we then found, and we should say that this had been pieced together by the um, historians before, that this was a likely sort of scenario. But there's a newspaper article from the following day um, after this royal visit, and I guess in a time when you know something like that was, uh, you know, the, the newspaper was where the entire story uh, was was recorded, rather than putting on Facebook, I suppose. It says underneath the headline in the article, "Interesting event fully described." It was described in, in such great detail that there's an entire section on the flags that were flying in Dundee on that day, including this tiny little mention of the Danish flag on the Royal Arch, which was again was quite sort of reassuring and that we'd gotten that to the connection right um, was quite cool. So by adding these details to the digital model, we hope to give an impression of the excitement and pageantry of a bygone era. Next slide, please. So with the digital models completed for each stage, um, we wanted to allow the public to explore them within the very space where the arches uh, once stood. So the foundations of the Royal Arch are currently delineated by four trees and four plaques depicting the different stages of its construction and deconstruction. During the Neon Festival, we used these plaques as a basis for an augmented reality app, which visualized the models in 3D. Next slide, please. So this augmented reality app was implemented by our colleague um, at the 3D Viz Lab, John Anderson. And here's the results of being tested in, in miniature uh, in our lab. So we're here using an iPad so that can be moved around the virtual model and, um, to kind of explore the, the model in that way. Uh, our aim here is to bring the 3D structure of the arch back to its original site 
in a way that also connects to the human stories that make the arch so compelling by encouraging those who download the app to interact with lost structures within its real world environment to kind of go down to the site on, on the docks now or in, in, the, in the kind of waterfront and use that space to imagine um, these sort of historic or lost pieces of architecture. The hope was to allow this formation of new relationships with the space and its history. Um, so I think these projects stood out for us because they deal with urban heritage, familiar landscapes that people engage with in their daily lives. The challenge then for us was really how to make these familiar landscapes strange, representing an unfamiliar time within a familiar cityscape. In layering source material, methods and types of imagery, our aim was to reimagine Dundee's lost spaces in a playful and engagement, uh, engaging way. Revisiting the physical evidence, so you saw the archival imagery, archaeological findings, artefacts and historic records, um, and responding to it creatively provides a tangible way for us to forge new relationships with old but familiar places. Um, so I think we've finished up um, in enough time to show some of the animations as well. Um, I should say none of these animations have sound because they were done for museum exhibits, so it's going to be really awkward while we sit here in silence. Sorry for that. <laughs> so you're going to show um, do the main yeah. order. Yeah, we always kind of make jokes that because we work in visual effects, it's just setting fire to everything and having explosions. Legitimately, through this project, we got set to set fire to two things. So. On this one as well, um, so I spent weeks and weeks just uh, kind of busting a gut to model this train and animate it and rig everything up. And um, my dad's quite into trains, so I sent him a little clip of the animation that I'd worked on. He came back and said, oh, do you know that little bit of steam, that steam that's just leaking from the piston? Oh, that's perfect. It's like, that's the only bit that Kieran did. <laughs> <laughs>
so if you um, remember the photograph that this is based on, we've we have flipped it so that the horse continues to go left to right, as we can get away with that for storytelling purposes. We got in a bit of trouble when we well when we did the next scene with the station. Again, we wanted to expose all the um, the trains so that you could see the kind of mechanism and see the reconstruction that Alice had worked on. And we made it, it was a conscious decision to um, not flip the photograph because it would have changed the. Um, the kind of geometry, the, well, the, the sort of topography of the station, um, but you will notice that the train is on the wrong side of the track, which of course our uh, train buffs didn't. Uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we should it's good say to have as well. Easter eggs, I think. Yeah, well, that's what we thought at the end of the project because people that like you know are really really into something they they're not going to enjoy it if they can't find things that they can pick at. So we, we thought we'd leave those things. <laughs> we should say as well that um, our friend and colleague Tom Paxton um, did the character animations in it as well. So. Yeah, there we go. We're done. <laughs>